Hello, my name is Cynthia Piemontesi, and I'm going to talk to you about our work on uh, tuning magnetic and electronic properties of neodymium nickelate by proximity layer. This work is a collaboration with the people I name here, and I would like to thank especially Milan Radovic, who was the initiator of the project and has performed the ARPES measurements I'll show you, while we performed the XMCD measurements that I'll also show. These measurements were done at Extreme and the CIS beam lines at the Swiss Light Source, and the work has been recently accepted for publication in Advanced Science. So we would like to uh, work with uh, correlated systems, which are very interesting because they show uh, the correlation between different types of ordering. You can have a coexistence between charge, magnetic, orbital ordering, or a lattice uh, transition, for example, a structural transition. And often these orderings are, are correlated to each other and are, are, are driving one another. If you grow these correlated systems in thin films, you can try to uh, control these orders by strain, for example, or if you do a heterostructure, you can try to tune these properties through the interface, for example, by symmetry breaking or by charge transfer. Here we have used proximity effect. So we have used the heterostructure to uh, bring a proximity layer to, the, um, to one of the systems and therefore tune its properties. The system we have studied is a thin layer of neodymium nickelate, five unit cells thick, deposited on LSMO with this doping, 15 unit, cell, unit cells thick. So LSMO is what we call the proximity layer. And we have deposited this, this B layer on an NGO substrate. Here I have the phase diagrams for these two systems. On the left, uh, the phase diagram for NNO. Here is temperature. On the bottom is the tolerance factor, and here is the nickel oxygen nickel angle. So the tolerance factor gives you an idea of how far you are from the absolutely uh, from the symmetric cubic perovskite structure. So the neodymium nickelate um, uh, has a perovskite structure with the nickel oxygen forming octahedra, and between the octahedra you have the lanthanide. Because the lanthanide is too small, this octahedra will have to rotate from this 180 degrees angle to accommodate the structure. So the smaller is the lanthanide, the smaller is the nickel oxygen angle, and also the smaller is the tolerance factor. So a tolerance factor of one would be a cubic structure. Here on, with the squares, you have the metal insulated transition, and you see that the metal insulated transition scales more or less with the size of the lanthanide. Um, the systems also order ferro antiferromagnetically at low temperature, and that's, that's given by these circles. And the nail temperature is not so correlated with the, um, with the size of the lanthanide. The system we are studying here is neodymium nickelate, which is together with praseodymium, the only two where the metal insulated transition and the nail temperature uh, are the same. So the, the system goes from metal to insulator and from paramagnetic to antiferromagnetic at the same temperature. And we want to tune one of these properties and observe what happens to the other one. For that, we have used a proximity layer, which is LSMO, uh, on, with this 33% uh, doping, which is the, the prototypical optimal um, uh, doping because it has the highest TC. So below TC, uh, LSMO is ferromagnetic metallic. So you're going to have a ferromagnetic metallic system in proximity to an antiferromagnetic insulator at the low temperatures. And our aim is to see what is the link between the magnetic and electronic structure of NNO by using this proximity layer. For that, we're going to use two synchrotron-based techniques. One is XMCD to probe the magnetic moment of the nickelate and of the manganite layer separately. And the other is to study the Fermi surface electronic structure of the NNO in proximity to LSMO. So we will use ARPIS for that. I start with the basic characterization, which is transport. So first for a thick film of NNO, so 20 unit cells on NGO, and we see here clearly the metal insulated transition is supposed to be with the hysteresis. And it happens around 150 Kelvin, or just below 150, because the thin film in the bulk is about 200 Kelvin. We compare that with a thin film 
of five unit cells of an anode directly on the substrate NGO. And we see this very thin film is always insulating. And if you compare now with our B layer, which is the five unit cells of an NO on 15 unit cells of LSMO, we have a very slight metal insulator transition. We don't have this uh, hysteresis and it's not so abrupt first order transition as it is uh, for the thick, thick film. And also in transports, um, we are never completely sure if we're only probing the transport of the top layer. So we have looked also at the electronic structure of NNO using RPIS. And that's what is shown here. So for the thick film, thin film, and the B layer. So for the thick film, uh, so here we have different cuts, Kx, Ky, along uh, different Kz, so for different instant energies. Um, and the Fermi surface of the thick film is similar to what has been published before. This work here, it's a work where, where the, the, the effect of strain has been looked at NNO. And, this, and it's the same thing. So you have an electron pocket at the gamma point and a whole pocket at the Z point. Uh, and the Fermi surface of the other films are topologically similar to the, to the thick film. Now we look at, and these measurements were done here at the metallic phase. Now we're gonna look at these two cuts that are, with, that are marked with this line. So gamma X and AR. Um, by looking at the energy uh, distribution curves at different temperatures. So now we compare the 150 Kelvin that I've shown before with the 75 Kelvin, which is here below the metal insulator transition for the thick film at least. So we have above the, the metallic uh, phase, we have this um, strong peak, uh, this quasi-particle peak with a considerable density of states at the Fermi level. When you lower temperature as expected, this density of states decreases and moves to uh, higher and higher binding energies. And the same thing happens for both directions. Now with the B layer, we see again, the red, curves look ve red curve looks very similar actually to the NO thick film. But when we lower the temperature, we don't have such a decrease in density of states around the Fermi energy. You have a very clear step function and it's still with a considerable density of, density of states. So what we see here is that the B layer and NO and LSMO, when an NO is on top of LSMO, it does not show the metal insulator transition. Then we have studied the magnetism by, look, by using XMCD. So I just uh, explained here quickly how this works. You do an X-ray absorption, uh, from uh, one of the elements in your system from a core state to P level to a 3D state, because these binding energies of the core levels, they are very different between the transition metal elements. This technique is element specific. So we know that at 640 V, we are measuring the manganese, for example. And when we come with polarized X-rays, we have a difference. We are gonna probe in majority the spin up or the spin down, depending on the polarization in majority. And therefore, we are going to have this difference in absorption. These two curves were measured with different X-ray polarizations. When you do the difference between them, we get this blue curve, which is the XMCD um, uh, signal. And the XMCD signal is proportional to the magnetic moment on the absorbing atom. So in this case, it's proportional to the magnetic moment on manganese, and most importantly, the net magnetic moment on the direction of the X-ray. So if you have an antiferromagnetic system, there should be no XMCD signal only in ferromagnets or paramagnets. So I start here with the manganese edge. We have here on top the XAS of a thick film of LSMO compared to the B layer in no LSMO. And we see the XAS is similar, which means the valence state on manganese is similar in both systems. Here on the bottom, I have two XMCD measurements, both at 25 Kelvin. One is at six and a half Tesla applied field and the other one is after we remove the field, so in remanence. We see that both systems show a remanence, which is expected for a ferromagnet. And we see also that the signal is higher for the LSMO, which has the NNO on top. And this has also been observed before that somehow the NNO's uh, uh, layer on top um, makes the surface maybe of LSMO better and the, and the, and the remanence moment is, is higher. So nothing too new here yet. Then we look at the nickel edge. This is the X-ray absorption, again, for a thick NNO film as a reference and the B layer. 
In the B layer, we have this additional strong peak, which comes from the lanthanum of the LSMO. But the nickel, which are this, this L3 and L2 here, they look very similar again between the B layer and the single layer, not showing that there is not a very strong change of uh, uh, valence states on the B layer. And here again, I have the XMCD at 6.5 Tesla and at 0, zero Tesla. So at 6.5, surprisingly, both of them show an XMCD, but for the single layer at zero Tesla, that goes away. So it's not remanent. So it, mean, it means that there is some paramagnetic moments on the single layer of NNO, maybe on the surface. However, on the B layer, we see that there is a clear remanence showing that there is a ferro ferromagnetism at the, at the NNO when deposited on top of LSMO. We also measure the hysteresis curves, element specific using the XMCD, and we see manganese and nickel have the same shape of hysteresis. And as a function of temperature here, the XMCD signal also goes to zero, more or less at the same temperature for manganese and nickel, showing that the ferromagnetism in NNO is induced by LSMO. So here we have seen that NNO, when it's in contact with LSMO, it shows ferromagnetism, which is not the case in the single layer as expected. But now we would like to see if there is a link between the electronic structure and the magnetism, and that has been provided by the DFT calculations. On this left side, I have the theory. On the right side is the data. The top graph is just a, 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 a zoom of this uh, energy area here. What we see in the calculations is that if you do the band structure for NNO, or you look for the yeah for yeah the band structure of NNO in an antiferromagnet or a paramagnetic system, you see this shift in the binding energy. So going actually from the paramagnetic system to the antiferromagnetic system, you have a higher uh, binding energy here around this energy range, about one eV. And the ferromagnetic system, a ferromagnetic NNO would have this binding energy somewhere between the two. When you look at our data in this energy region, we see exactly the same trend that the NNO at low temperature, which is antiferromagnetic, so the thick NNO at low temperature, and the thick NNO at uh, above the metal insulator transition, so the paramagnetic has the same energy shift, so higher binding energy for the antiferromagnetic system. And our NNO and LSMO is exactly in between. So showing that this, this changing electronic structure we see is because of the ferromagnetic moments of NNO. So concluding our work, we see that the ultra thin NNO is ferromagnetic contact with LSMO. The electronic structure shows no metal insulated transition in NNO. And the DFT calculations are in qualitative agreements with uh, the energy, energy distribution curves measured by ARPIS. And they show the link between the, the magnetic um, ordering and, um, and the electronic structure. So our work, in summary, shows the control of the electronic properties of an NO by using a proximity layer. So using LSMO, we induce a ferromagnetic moment in NO, and at the same time, an NO does not go through the metal insulator transition when it's ferromagnetic. Uh, I'd like to thank you for watching my talk, and I hope uh, there are some interesting questions and discussions.